Good evening. We welcome you to the evening service of Lurgan Free Presbyterian Church. On behalf of the minister, the Reverend Thomas Murray, the session and members, we're now going to have a message in song. I want to read from John's Gospel, chapter 6, the longest chapter in the book. John's Gospel, chapter 6. There we have at the beginning the story of what's known as the feeding of the 5,000. But the next day, the Lord spoke to the crowd who had returned. And let's take up our reading in verse 30 of John's Gospel, chapter 6. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, 
he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And then dropping down to verse 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof, and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. May God bless this, the reading of his holy word. If you remember at the beginning of the lockdown, there was a tremendous shortage of bread on the shelves and of flour. When we managed to purchase some flour, my wife decided to get out an electric bread maker that we had purchased some years ago. My, it was enjoyable to wake up to the beautiful aroma of freshly baked bread, but it was even more enjoyable to cut a slice and to eat it. And eating that slice cupped from that bread reminded me of a wonderful truth that the Lord Jesus Christ taught the people in John 6 about himself and about the simplicity of salvation. You see, in Christ's day, bread formed the staple diet of the people. The day before, he had multiplied the five small barley loaves, enough to feed 5,000 men plus women and children. And so the next day, as the crowd were there, he turned to them and he rebuked them. In verse 26, he's really saying to them, look, you are only following me for free bread and to see a miracle. And he rebuked them because he told them that they ought to labor to obtain a bread that can't be baked in an oven or purchased in a shop. He was speaking, of course, of spiritual bread that came down from heaven. And that bread is a person. He's speaking about himself. For in verse 35, we have this great title, and it's emphatic. It's one of the great I am's of John. He declares in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. I still remember some decades ago as we were traveling to church, the radio was on on a Sunday morning, and the Radio Ulster service was being broadcast And the bishop in the Church of Ireland said something like this, In the feeding of the 5,000, we're not sure how it happened. Maybe the little boy took out his lunch and shared it, and those who were too greedy to share felt guilty, and so they shared their lunch too, and everybody had enough. Or whether it was a conjuring trick or an actual miracle is not really important. The important thing is that the lesson Christ is teaching is this we ought to care for the hungry and provide food. Now, that is not true. It was a miracle. It was something that only the Lord could do. And the purpose of the miracle was not to teach us that we ought to feed the poor. Of course, there are other parts of the Bible tell us that we, especially as Christians, ought to have compassion on the poor and the needy and seek to reach those that are hungry and starving. But that's not the purpose of the miracle. Because in John chapter 20, if you read that end of that chapter, 
It tells us there why John wrote these. In fact, he recorded seven miracles, and they're called signs or miracles. And John tells us why he wrote it. John 20, 31, listen that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. These miracles, including the miracle of the multiplying of the bread, is in Scripture so that you, reading about it or listening this morning, may believe that Jesus is the anointed promised Messiah and that you would come and trust Him and receive eternal life life. You see, it was a miracle with a meaning. It was a sign with a significance. But the sad thing is, the thousands who had witnessed him performing the miracle, when he preached the next day, they had missed the meaning. They didn't see the significance of what he had done. All they wanted was free bread. Don't miss the message. Don't miss the message. John 6, 35, Christ is the bread from heaven. Notice the people had a need. Verse 35 speaks about hunger. Now, there were many people going to and fro at that time. They were told it's the time of the Passover. That's earlier in chapter 6. You probably know that at the Passover, most Jewish families would travel down to Jerusalem to the temple. Remember, our Savior, at 12 years of age, went with Mary and Joseph that journey. We know it was the three days, at least, to go that journey. So, thousands were in the move. That is one explanation why so many people gathered to hear the Savior. They had listened all day to the greatest preacher. It's coming nighttime. They had nothing to eat. And Christ was moved with compassion because they were hungry. Now, not starving in the sense of people in famines around the world, sadly, that happened. But they were hungry. They, they had a, nothing to eat all day. And so, he sensed their physical need, and he cared for that by taking the five loaves and multiplying them, and the disciples distributed the bread, and everyone had enough. But Christ also saw their spiritual need. So, the next day when they came back, he began to take that physical bread and the miracle he had performed as an illustration of himself and the simplicity of salvation. You see, you have a spiritual hunger. Whether you recognize it or not, you do. You have a need that can only be met by bread from heaven. I'm speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, what does it matter, the quality of bread that you can buy in the shop, the quality of bread you eat, and what a variety there is in supermarkets today? What does it matter, the good food, if you eat tasty bread, wear lovely clothes, you drive a nice car, live in a nice house? Nothing wrong with those things. But what does it matter if when you get sick, you go to a, a, a beautiful hospital that's clean, and you get the best medical help? But then what does it matter if you die, and you're buried in a beautiful casket, and at your funeral there are beautiful words say, what do all those physical things matter if you go out into eternity without Christ, the bread of life, and end up in a Christless hell. And the Savior saw their spiritual need, and Christ can meet the spiritual need by Himself. You see, Christ is heaven's bread for our spiritual need. And just as Christ performed a miracle with the multiplying of the loaves to satisfy their physical need, Christ performs a miracle to meet your spiritual need. I'll never forget many years ago when I was a pastor in the church, a young man, probably 20, 21, I knew him well, brought up in the church, family, grandparents, and so on, came to the meetings. I assumed that he was a believer because he attended everything, and he asked to see me after a service, and I spoke to him, and 
He said, well, what is it you want to see me about? And he didn't answer. And I said, tell me, are you saved? He said, Mr. Johnson, people in the church think I am. I've made professions. But lately, I've come to realize that I do not genuinely know Christ as my Savior. And then he said this, never forget it. Mr. Johnson, I need the Lord to do a miracle in my life. I'll never forget that. Because he had come to realize that salvation is more than turning over a new leaf, joining a church, trying to improve our conduct, adhering to a creed. Salvation is a miracle. It's a miracle. The people are in need, and only a miracle can meet that spiritual need. But secondly, in John 6, 35, Notice the provision to meet their need. And the provision is a person. Christ said, I am the bread of life. In verse 32, he says, I am the true bread. Verse 51, the living bread, the bread of sacrifice. In verse 33, for the bread of God is he, a person speaking of himself, which cometh down from heaven and giveth life. Now, the life our text, and used in other verses in the passage, is speaking about is not simply existence. Everybody will exist forever. There was a time you and I were not. There never will be a time we will cease to be. But Christ is referring to a quality of life, spiritual life, eternal life, that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, He is the bread, offers Himself to us. Now, how is Christ the bread? Well, notice He referred over and over again to the manna. That had occurred hundreds of years before when the Israelites were going through the wilderness. God gave them bread from heaven. The manna was called bread. The people didn't know what to call it, so they called it, what is it? What is it? Mana, that's what the Hebrew word means, mana, what is it? Well, Christ is comparing himself to the manna, that heavenly bread. And it's so appropriate that he who is the bread of life came down from heaven and was born in Bethlehem, which means literally the house of bread because he came to be the bread of life. You see, that manna is symbolic of Christ and his birth. It came at night. Most didn't see it coming. Just as when Christ was born in Bethlehem, few people in this world took any notice whatsoever. The coming of the manna in Exodus 16, you can read about it in a few verses in Numbers 11, but you will find in reading Exodus 16 that the manna and its coming was associated with the glory of God. And of course, when Christ was born, didn't the angels sing glory to God in the highest? Glory to God in the highest. And then you will read how it is a picture of Christ in his being, Christ's character. Oh, he, he's different than us. He's the God man. He's the perfect man. You see, you read the description of the manna, Go through and note the verses. It was white. That speaks of his purity. Oh, Christ never sinned. He knew no evil. He did no evil. He, he, in him was no sin. He's absolutely perfect. The sinless one, the purity. And then it tasted like honey wafers. Does that not speak of his pleasantness? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It was like bdellium. That was a precious stone. Oh, the preciousness of Christ. Believers, we can say, Jesus is precious to me. And then it was round-shaped, and that speaks of perfection, the perfection of our Savior. It tasted of fresh oil. Is that not the power of Christ? Christ is the heavenly manna in his birth, in his being, ah, but also in his bruising and baking. The people didn't just lift up the manna from the ground and eat it. It says in Exodus 16 and Numbers 11, they had to take it and grind it in a mortar or crush it in the mill, just as you do with wheat or barley grain. 
to make the flour, to bake the bread. Christ was bruised. He was bruised for our iniquities. And then when it was put together, it was put into the oven. Or in another verse, it says it was put into the fire. And the Lord Jesus Christ is heaven's bread for us because He's absolutely perfect and He's precious and with the description of His being. But He was bruised for us, for our sins, our iniquities. And then He was placed into the oven, as it were, of God's wrath. And the fire in Scripture, it speaks of judgment, that fire of God against my sin and your sin, believer, that fire that should have fallen upon us for all eternity, hell fire, that day at Calvary, He endured the fire. He endured the fire. And thank God, He has become the bread of God for us. I was the one had sinned, but He endured the punishment. The people had a need. They were hungry. The provision for the need, Christ said, I am the bread of life, the person. Ah, but what about the partaking, the partaking? How do you eat of Christ? Oh, we must get this absolutely right. The manna was a gift from heaven. The people had to freely receive it. It was available to them all, but they had to take it when they were in the wilderness. They had to come. And Christ is the true bread sent down from heaven. And He said, if you come to Me and eat of Me. You see, a slice of bread, let's say even toasted in our sandwich or a slice just buttered sitting there, it will not benefit anybody unless you reach for it, take it, eat it, and it becomes part of you. That's what the Lord means in verse 35 when He talks about coming and receiving Him. In verse 51, if any man eat of this bread, and then we come to verse 53, which is really simple but has been controversial, in verse 53, he says, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, ye have no life in you. The Roman Catholic Church, in its perversion, tries to take this verse as an argument for the Mass, where they claim that when the priest takes that wafer bread and holds it up and says, This is my body, that it's actually changed into the flesh the body of Christ, and they quote this verse, except you eat his flesh. It's not talking about a literal eating. It's a figure. It's a figure. I remember some years ago, I recorded it and had watched it, and oh, some years ago, I remember there was a documentary produced on one of the local TV channels of eight-year-olds in West Belfast who were preparing to take their first communion. Very interesting, because I wrote down some of the, what was said. And none addressed the eight-year-old children in the school. And this is what she said. Children, 2,000 years ago, Christ took bread and said, this is my body. And when you go to your first communion, the priest will repeat those words, this is my body. And the bread is no longer bread, but becomes Jesus. Now, boys and girls, that is hard to believe. But we have to keep saying, Lord, I believe, and you will take Jesus into your body for the first time. You know, it was almost laughable but tragic. They interviewed some of the boys and girls, some who were brought there in carriages and expensive limousines for their first communion to take Jesus for the first time. One little boy afterwards he said this, did you enjoy today? Oh, yes, I received so much, 465 pounds in gifts, and I took Jesus into my body. That no doubt surprises people. My brother-in-law, he's now about 80 years of age, was actually born in Colombia, South America. His parents had come from Spain. He heard two lady missionaries preach the gospel, and along with his brother, they trusted Christ just a youngster. Their mother saw the change in their lives, and she wanted to go along and hear the missionaries 
what they were saying. So she put on her Sunday go to mass dress. I'm talking many decades ago, 70 years ago in Colombia. And she went along to hear these evangelicals and the two ladies spoke. One of them, by the way, became a member of our Sandown Church and was actually buried from there. Uh, she was an aunt of one of the members in our Newton Hours Church. And that lady, and I met her some years ago when I was in Colombia, the first time she heard the gospel, she left that meeting and went home and she told her husband, I'm satisfied. And she never attended the Mass again. And she began to go to the little group of Protestants, evangelicals, and my brother-in-law, Juan, though he was young, tells me of the stones that used to hit the tin roof when they were gathering together. And you may know in the 1950s, even Christian pastors were martyred in that land of Colombia. There was terrible persecution. What I'm saying is, this verse has nothing to do with a literal, carnal eating of Christ. It's a picture, and it's so clear it is so, so clear, except ye eat. It's, and it's a singular, completed action, a once for all eating. That's verse 53. It's a once for all eating. What it means is, just as the day before those people took the bread and ate it, it became part of them. Christ is saying, listen, you need spiritual bread, and I'm that bread, and you need to come and take me and trust me as your Savior, for I am the bread of life. Now, in verse 63, it explains it. For Christ said the words. You see, we feed upon Christ, and we trust Him because we read about Christ in the Bible, which is also called the bread, the Word of God. And we believe what He says, come unto me, all ye that labor. We come. We believe John 6, 35, where Christ said, come, believe, receive, eat of me. And we reach out the hand of faith, as it were, and we take Him. You see, the day before that free bread, literal bread, and I know how people run for free bread. It was many years ago in Armagh, my mother in her 90s lived with us on Christmas Eve. She wanted to go a little walk, so we got the rollator out into the car. And of course, being a lady, she wanted to go to the shops. That's where the walk was. So we went into a supermarket there. It was about three o'clock Christmas Eve. We're just about to leave when over the speaker there came a message. All the bread and pancakes and everything on the shelves, they're free for the taking because obviously there's going to be a holiday. You should have seen the stampede. People grabbed, there was a couple, I'll never forget it, they had literally armfuls and they're throwing them into a van and literally running in. And the man, a little bit embarrassed, turned around, it's to feed the cattle. <laughs> well, I'll be honest, we took some as well and put them in a the freezer. Free bread! They took the multiplied bread the day before. But yet when Christ said to them, look, you, you took that bread, that miracle bread, and you took it, but come to me. And those same people refused to come. And it says in John 6, those thousands of people turned away, wouldn't take them. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? Or, or I think of this, imagine when we get back to church and maybe we will be allowed, we trust sometime soon, maybe a church tea, and someone comes round, would you like a sandwich? Oh yes, I'd love one. Well, go ahead and take it. Oh, I'd love that. It looks beautiful, that sandwich. I'd, well, take it. And you sit there and you don't... Re What's wrong with you? Go ahead, take it. And yet when we present the gospel and say, the Lord Jesus Christ has said, come to me, I am the bread of life. Just come, reach out the hand of faith and take me. Yet so many refuse to take Christ. Are you saved? Do you know Christ as the bread of life? I just want to point out one verse in closing, and it's verse 56. It's changed now. Christ says, he that eateth, now that's continuous. Christ has made the point, if you want to have spiritual life, to be saved, to know that you will be saved for all eternity, you come 
and you receive him. But now what he means in this verse 56, if you continue to eat, then you'll dwell in him, you'll fellowship in him. And believer, yes, we call upon those who are not saved to take Christ as the bread of life, but believer, to be satisfied and strengthened every day, you need to feed upon Christ. How do you do that? In the Word, in the Word of God. We feed upon the incarnate Word, that's Christ, in the inspired Word, Scripture. Lovely story, and I finish with this. I love to read about the wartime, and it is interesting that Dresden, at the end of the Second World War, was absolutely obliterated by Allied bombing. Many orphans were left to scavenge in the ruins. There was awful suffering of those orphans. In fact, when my wife and I were missionaries in New Guinea, we're way back in the jungle, we're no other Europeans, and the first time we met this missionary couple, we thought it was strange that she seemed to be wearing a wig, not that I like to judge women's hairstyles, but it was fairly obvious. And then we discovered she, although she was an American citizen, she had been born in Germany towards the end of the Second World War. And due to lack of vitamins and minerals in the first few weeks and months of her life, she never had hair on any part of her body. You know what was strange? A, a lady actually from, had lived in Germany, round about the same age, came to the field and she had the same difficulty. I'm just pointing out how these little children suffered so terribly. And so I can, knowing those, well, the one lady and hearing of the other one, we just saw her, we didn't know her as such. But knowing Mrs. Tuselli and her husband, it brings it forcibly to us that those little children, they, they were scavenging for food and dying, and the American GIs, the army set up, and the orphanage tried to get them to come in. The children were afraid, obviously, enemy soldiers and so on. They fed them, but they couldn't get the children to lie down and go to sleep. And actually, the cook came up with a brilliant idea. I don't know if he ever studied psychology, but he said, I'll get them to sleep. And he baked little, we would call them baps, little small loaves, and he gave each child one. And through the interpreter, this is for your breakfast, this is for tomorrow. And those, can you see them? Little children had been starving and scavenging among the ruins to get bits of scraps of food. They were holding in their hand the bread for tomorrow. And you know, most of them just fell asleep because they had bread for tomorrow. Oh, if you know Christ as your Savior, He's the bread of life. Come to him and you'll have eternal life. And then as you walk with him and know him, you can put your head on the pillow at night and know that he is all you need. May God enable us to feed upon Christ. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise thee that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing we can have life through his name. Lord, we pray for any listening who have never yet come to Christ. Oh, convict them, enable them to receive Christ as their Savior. And Lord, we thank thee that Christ not only saves, but he satisfies, and he strengthens, and he sustains us. And we pray, Lord, there would be that spiritual feeding upon Christ every day. Bless this congregation, the minister, the session, the committee, and all involved in it. We pray now that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit may rest upon us. Amen.